As a diplomat to diplomat, uh, we're going to speak uh, this evening about diplomacy and the history of diplomacy. So it's a pleasure to have you all with us. I will introduce our uh, speaker uh, tonight, um, Emmanuel Navon. Uh, he is an international uh, relations expert who lecture in Tel Aviv University at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya and the Israeli Military Academy. He is a fellow in Jerusalem Institute and, uh, for Strategy and Security and at the Kohelet Policy Forum and is a foreign affairs analyst for Israel-based news TV channel and expert on Israeli foreign policy. And he published dozens of articles and three books. Uh, he's gonna to talk to us uh, tonight about his uh, new book, which will be published in 11 days from now, The Star and the Scepter, a Diplomatic History of Israel, which sound fascinating to hear about the history of the Israeli diplomacy from the ancient times uh, uh, till today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, if I may, I will ask uh, uh, Emmanuel a few questions and then we will open the floor uh, uh, to your questions and uh, you can refer it in the, uh, uh, to us in the uh, side chat and we will let you ask them uh, lately. Uh, for now, you are all on mute. We will open the microphones once you need to ask a question. So, uh, uh, Emmanuel, please tell us a bit about your new book. What led you to write it? What is the meaning of the title, The Star and the Scepter? And... Thank you very much indeed, uh, Shai. Um, and thank you uh, also, David. Thank you to uh, Elnet for uh, this invitation. I'm actually very uh, excited because as uh, Shai mentioned, uh, the book is really coming out uh, in about 10 days, and this uh, happens to be uh, the first uh, event to promote uh, the book. Of course, today, because of the pandemic, uh, events take uh, place online on Zoom, and this uh, is indeed the first uh, launching event for my book. Uh, so I'm very excited, and it's obviously appropriate to do it with Elnet, because I've had the uh, privilege of working with Elnet for many years and of uh, uh, talking to delegations. Uh, from Europe, and uh, we've had a very uh, fruitful cooperation, so I'm very grateful for Elnet uh, for hosting this first uh, event uh, about my book. Uh, as for your questions, Shai, um, what brought me to write this book and what is the uh, meaning of its title? Uh, so I've been teaching a class on uh, Israeli foreign policy for many years uh, at Tel Aviv University and at the IDC, and, and I've been struck throughout the years about the lack of um, of literature about that topic. In other words, you do have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of books uh, that uh, deal with specific aspects of uh, Israel's foreign policy. Uh, most typically, uh, of course, the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict or the uh, Israel-U.S. Uh, relationship, uh, and generally also uh, over specific periods of time. Uh, but there's no book. I mean, there was no book until next week uh, that covers all aspects. Uh, of Israel's foreign policy uh, with a wide historical perspective. Uh, because even though, of course, modern Israel uh, became independent in 1948, uh, the, uh, you cannot understand, in my opinion, uh, the foreign relations of Israel without understanding the wider historical context uh, of Jewish history, uh, which is why I decided to write this book. Uh, the only slight competition to my book uh, was published a few months ago by a former professor of mine at uh, the Hebrew University, Uri Biala. Uh, I looked at his book, and also, it's also very limited in scope, uh, both uh, space-wise and time-wise. It's only until 1993, and it only covers a few aspects of Israel's foreign policy. So I'm very excited about the fact that uh, for the first time, we're going to have a really, uh, for the first time in my opinion, uh, the most wide range uh, coverage of that topic. Uh, which brings me to the uh, second part of your question, the meaning of the title. Uh, the meaning of the title, the star and the scepter, uh, is taken from a, uh, is of course, a quote from the book of, ne of Numbers in the Bible, uh, when uh, the prophet Bilam is paid literally to curse uh, the Jewish people before its entry in the land of Israel. And instead of cursing the Jewish people, he ends up 
blessing it. And one of the uh, curses from blessing is a, a star uh, comes out of uh, Jacob and a scepter from Israel, which is a strange, uh, is a strange uh, verse. What does it mean? Uh, a star comes out of Jacob and a scepter from Israel. Well, my understanding of that verse, which is why I chose it also uh, to be the title of the book, is that um, the name Jacob uh, was changed in the, in the Bible to Israel. And yet the text keeps using uh, the two names uh, throughout the book of, the, of Deuteronomy, of the Torah. Unlike uh, other names that were also changed, uh, the name of Avram became Avraham and Sarai became Sarah. And the text never uses back and forth their older names. It's only in the case of Jacob and Israel. Uh, why is that? My understanding is that uh, Jacob received the name Israel at a very specific moment uh, when he was confronted with that mysterious uh, angel or man in the middle of the night before confronting his revengeful brother Esau. And it is only after Jacob uh, proved his willingness and ability to use physical force uh, that he received the name Israel. Uh, before that, uh, he was, uh, Jacob was des described as a man of the tents, uh, a man who studied, uh, who uh, basically inherited the spiritual uh, uh, inheritance, I would say, of his uh, father and grandfather, but was not able to fight for it in the real world. His brother Esav, on the other hand, uh, was an, only a man of physical force without any spirituality. And neither of them uh, was, um, uh, was able to inherit and, um, and promote the, uh, historic, the historical and uh, spiritual heritage of Abraham and Isaac. And that's my theory, that it's only after Jacob, uh, as I said, proved his ability and willingness to use force that he became Israel. And I claim in my book that throughout the history of the Jewish people, uh, we've had this tension uh, between spirituality and, uh, and I would say uh, the, uh, the aspiration on the other hand of materiality. And you see it, you see it throughout Jewish history. Uh, and I think that the, uh, what explains historically the success of the Jewish people, especially di diplomatically, is this ability to balance between the two. Uh, this is my thesis throughout the book, that Israel owes its um, diplomatic successes, both in modern and ancient times, thanks to a balance, which is never easy to reach, uh, between a strong sense of historical mission on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, an ability and willingness to adapt this historical mission, or this sense of historical mission, to the real world uh, and to fight for it. Uh, just to end with this point and to give you one example, uh, in the times of uh, the, uh, I would say, when modern Zionism emerged as a political movement uh, at the end of the 19th century, you had these different tendencies in the uh, Jewish people. You had the, uh, I would say, the purely spiritual and anti-materialistic tendency represented typically by uh, among uh, German Jews such as Hermann Cohen, and uh, Franz Rosenzweig, who completely rejected uh, Zionism as something that would uh, pervert uh, Judaism. And then you had, of course, the, on, the other, on the other hand, on the other extreme, the Canaanites, who uh, completely rejected the Jewish heritage and only wanted to build physical force. So I claim, uh, after reviewing 3,000 years of uh, diplomatic history, uh, that uh, ultimately, uh, the, uh, what explains the uh, achievements and successes of Israel as a people throughout, the, throughout history is reaching this difficult balance between spirituality and power between the star and the scepter. That's, that's uh, fantastic. I think uh, Clausewitz uh, said that the war is the continuance of diplomacy in different, in other ways. So the, the force and the, uh, and, and the diplomacy always somehow play a, play a role in the game of nations when they try to establish their, uh, their interest and to claim them. So uh, uh, if we spoke about the history of, of, of the, um, the Jewish uh, diplomacy, 
Can you give us some, some stories or examples from, from the ancient kingdom of Israel of successful diplomacy? So if we're talking about ancient Israel, uh, as I said, I've been looking through, uh, you know, diplomatic history of ancient Israel through the ages, uh, the ancient kingdoms of Israel. And I think what struck me is two things. Uh, first of all, uh, the contrast between the successful rebellion against uh, Greek rule and the disastrous rebellion against Roman rule. I'm talking about the Hasmoneans in the second century uh, before the Common Era and the rebellion of Bar Kokhba against the Roman Empire uh, in the uh, second century of the Common Era. Uh, what do we have in both cases? Uh, in the case of, uh, of the Hasmonean revolt uh, against uh, the Greeks, uh, it was a rebellion against an attempt of uh, Greek culture to deny and even eradicate uh, Jewish culture, which was considered incompatible uh, with what the Greeks called the Okumene, the, the Greek world. Uh, Judaism was considered by uh, many uh, Greek intellectuals as being completely incompatible uh, with uh, Greek culture and Greek, I would say, even imperialism. Uh, and therefore, there was really an attempt, as I said, uh, to deny uh, Jewish uh, national uh, rights and Jewish identity. The rebellion against that rule was successful. And in fact, the uh, Hasmonean revolt turned into some kind of political and religious restoration uh, of, a modern, uh, for, of a modern Jewish sovereignty or kingdom uh, by those times standards. Um, a willingness to fight uh, for a strong sense of historical mission, but also based on a realistic assessment of the forces at stake of the uh, Jewish military facing at the time, the Greek military and the Greek empire had to recognize this uh, restored and uh, re-establish uh, Jewish state or Jewish kingdom uh, at the time, uh, which lasted for about 300 years. Uh, but uh, the same kingdom eventually was erased and destroyed by the Romans precisely because I claim that the Barkova revolt did not realistically take into account uh, the actual power of the Roman Empire and completely lacked uh, a political realism, which is why the Romans were able to completely wipe out uh, this rebellion and eventually uh, to destroy not only the temple in Jerusalem, uh, but Jewish sovereignty and scattered Jews uh, throughout the empire. You see this also taking shape in modern times. Uh, I give this example also uh, in my book uh, during the, uh, uh, you know, the modern Zionist movement. Very soon, the Zionist movement was faced uh, with tough choices between uh, faithfulness to history on the one hand and political realism on the other hand. I think the first instance was when Theodor Herzl uh, was presented with the option by the British uh, Secretary of Colonies, Joseph Chamberlain, to establish a Jewish state in Uganda since the British Empire at the time, as we know, did not rule over uh, the former, uh, I mean, the ancient land of Israel. Uh, and, and this proposal was submitted to the uh, Jewish Congress and it created a very tough debate uh, between those who call themselves realists and say we need Jewish sovereignty now because of the pogroms in Russia and those who said if we do that we will lose the uh, historical connection to our past and it will defeat the purpose. At the end the Uganda proposal was rejected out of a sense of fidelity and faithfulness to the land of Israel. On the other hand later on the second I think that the second tough test of political realism versus uh, faithfulness to your history was the first time that a partition plan was proposed in 1937 by the uh, British Peel Commission on a very tiny part of what was, what was established as the uh, British Mandate on Palestine by the League of Nations. And here, the dilemma and the debate was that on the one hand, and that was political realism, uh, the Zionist movement for the first time was offered actual sovereignty in a very tiny part of the land of Israel at a time when it was dearly needed because this was already four years after the Nazis came to power in Germany and there was a need for immediate Jewish sovereignty 
uh, to have Jewish immigration. On the other hand, if you look at the map of the Pill Commission, it was on a very, very teeny part of the land of Israel with no connection whatsoever uh, to Jerusalem. This time, the majority of the Jewish leadership accepted the compromise. Uh, but uh, these are two examples. And just to conclude with this point, um, you know, on the one hand, we have, of course, this quote from the uh, book of Psalms, if I forget thee, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget me, which uh, represents, of course, this faithfulness uh, to Jewish history and to the Jewish past. And on the other hand, you have this in interesting quote, which I found from Ben-Gurion, uh, when he was reminded in 1947, when he accepted the UN's partition plan, which itself was also very difficult to accept, he was reminded about the decision made by the Zionist movement in 1941 during the war uh, in the United States at the Biltmore Hotel. Uh, and, the, uh, and this decision came to be known as the Biltmore decision, which called for establishing a Jewish state on the entire uh, British mandate in Palestine. And when Ben-Gurion was reminded about this decision in 1947, that was already two years after the end of the Second World War and the Holocaust, he said, quote unquote, built more, schmilt more, we need a Jewish state. And that was the real politic aspect, if you will, of Ben Gurion. And again, it goes to show, as I claim, that this balance between faithfulness to the past and adaptability to the reality at a certain point was always what made the day. So if we speak about uh, Ben Gurion and, 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 and real politics, I believe he said that in the state of Israel, in order to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. And, and I guess it goes together with the faithfulness that you just spoke about. So does the history of, of, of the Jewish people has an impact of, of the, the Israel foreign policy and diplomacy of today? Well, I think this uh, is very clear, uh, for example, when you look at uh, Israel's uh, relation with the uh, diaspora. This is a very clear element of the Jewish aspect, I would say, of Israel's foreign policy. Now, obviously, Israel is not the only country in the world that has a large diaspora. Uh, you have large Indian, Chinese, and other diasporas throughout the world, or the Irish diaspora. But in the case of the state of Israel, uh, it figures in our Declaration of Independence. Uh, Israel's Declaration of Independence calls upon all Jews throughout the world uh, to basically join uh, the project of rebuilding uh, the Jewish state. And of course, the legislation passed by Israel uh, shortly after its independence, the, uh, uh, the law of return in 1950, which automatically granted the right of immigration to all Jews around the world, and therefore basically turned every Jew around the world uh, into potential citizens of the state of Israel, whether or not they were interested in making Aliyah or not. And of course, this strong connection to the Jewish diaspora and this claim to talk in the name of the Jewish diaspora very often created a tension between the national interest and the ideological aspect of foreign policy. What do I mean? In terms of ideology, as I said, uh, part of the Jewish ethos was always to uh, kind of uh, be the defender of uh, a danger Jewish community throughout the world. But very often, this proclaimed uh, aspiration, which, as I said, figures in the Declaration of Independence, caused trouble for Israel's national interest and foreign policy. Typically, for example, if you take our relation with Russia or the for former Soviet Union. Uh, so in the case of the former Soviet Union, it's interesting because the uh, USSR at the time, uh, when Israel became independent, had an estimated 3 million Jews, which is, of course, a very large population. And even though Stalin made the decision of recognizing Israel in 1948, and even of allowing the selling of weapons to Israel via Czechoslovakia the same year, he only did it uh, because of political calculations, because he figured, he figured that this would help driving the British out of the Middle East. On the other hand, he had a problem, and of course, communism in general had a problem with Zionism, because Zionism offered a national answer to what was called at the time the Jewish question. And communism had its own answer to that question, which was the end of nationalism and religion and uh, replacing uh, the capitalist system by the socialist system where there would be no difference of race, religion, and anything else. And obviously 
the very day that Golda Meir, Israel's first ambassador to the USSR, submitted her letter of credentials. And uh, it happens to be that now that she was ambassador to the USSR, she did something which she, did not do, she didn't do very often in Israel itself. Uh, she went to synagogue on the high holidays and on the Rosh Hashanah service, she was received literally as a hero by the crowds of Jews in Moscow. And this embarrassed the Kremlin uh, enormously because the Jews were not supposed to have any uh, national aspiration or any interest in Zionism or in the state of Israel. And very quickly, the Pravda became very hostile to Israel and to Zionism, saying, well, yes, we, we helped Israel in 1948, but that's only because, uh, you know, Hebrew workers were fighting against British imperialists. But obviously, the answer to the Jewish problem is socialism and not Zionism. And throughout the years, and starting with Ben-Gurion, all Israeli leaders continued to call upon Moscow to allow the Jews to make Aliyah, to leave the Soviet Union, to come to Israel, to let Jews practice the religion and learn Hebrew in the Soviet Union, the Russians didn't like that. And it created many, many tensions with the Soviet Union. And I think this is a real typical example of how the Jewish heritage had an impact on our diplomacy, sometimes, sometimes at the expense of the national interest, or if you like, in that case of the uh, relations uh, with, the, uh, with a specific country, in that case, the Soviet Union. Uh, thank you. I will ask one more question, then we open the floor to uh, the participants, uh, because the ELNET, as you know, is the organization who deal with the relations between Israel and Europe. I would love to hear your opinion how the uh, relations with Europe uh, evolve over time, and, and what do you think, what is your prospect uh, for the future? So I think that in the case of Europe, here also you have a mixture of um, ideology and realpolitik, uh, of principles and interest. Uh, probably the first instance where Israel faced a dilemma when it came to Europe uh, was with the reparation agreement with Germany in 1951-1952, when Ben-Gurion uh, negotiated a reparation agreement with West Germany uh, because that was on the side of realpolitik, it was necessary to sustain the Israeli economy and absorb migration from Eastern Europe and from Germany itself, from Jews who had been the victim of German occupation and of the Holocaust. But that raised a very uh, sensitive and emotional issue in Israel where the opposition completely opposed that deal, saying basically by signing this deal, you're basically forgiving the Germans for what they did. So that was really, and, and it it became, it was huge in Israel. The, the controversy, the public controversy in Israel was huge uh, of, the, of those who spoke in the names of political realism and national interest, and those who spoke in terms of principles and memory uh, and history. So I think this is probably one of the strongest example at the beginning of Israel's, uh, of the first years of, uh, of Israel's independence. And of course, throughout the years, uh, this emotional side of our relation was also obvious when it came to a relation uh, with Great Britain, uh, but also with France. But at the end of the day, since obviously it's a bit difficult to review a relation with 27 countries over 70 years in four minutes, I will just point out to this, which is that the bottom line is that with all the difficulties that we have with Europe, the bottom line is that the relation has improved in, in recent years basically because Israel has become a, an economic and also an energy powerhouse. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I happen to believe that in international relations, there are no uh, real feelings or friends, there are only interests. And uh, the fact that Israel has such issues with Europe in the past, if you look at the uh, lowest point of Israel-Europe relations, when was it? It was after the Yom Kippur War and the oil embargo, when the European economies were very much dependent on Middle Eastern oil at the time. They were extremely sensitive to the oil embargo, and that, of course, had a very strong impact on their relation with Israel, which was, of course, uh, the whole point to begin with, and which was the reason why OPEC uh, had initiated the embargo, the oil embargo, against Israel to impact on the foreign policy of Europe towards Israel. With time, however, when you fast forward to 2020, uh, today, we already, I think, in the post-oil economy. Uh, oil is no longer a weapon 
the, uh, the decrease of oil prices is structural and inevitable. It's been, uh, uh, it's been sp uh, speeded up by the corona crisis, but it is a historical process. And this is also why we have this improving of relations uh, with the Arab countries in the Middle East, I mean, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, but same thing with Europe. Europe today is almost not sensitive uh, to uh, uh, energy pressures. On the other hand, it needs Israeli uh, technology, which is also why Israel is part since 1996 of Europe's uh, research and development program, because Israel is a technology uh, powerhouse. And of course, in the energy sphere, uh, it is very telling uh, that uh, a few months ago, Israel signed a regional agreement about energy, about natural gas uh, with European countries, mostly Italy, Greece, and Cyprus, but also with its neighbors, Egypt uh, and Jordan, precisely because Israel also became an energy powerhouse. It's, this also has been improving uh, relations with Europe. This doesn't mean, of course, uh, that we should just rest and, and wait for natural gas and technology to do the job. Uh, we need a lot of diplomacy and we need a lot of proactive diplomacy, which is also why we need LNET uh, to not only count, as I said, on natural gas and technology. But the bottom line is uh, that uh, precisely because uh, diplomatic relations are mostly based on interests, uh, the, the curve has been in Israel's advantage. But of course, there's still a lot of work to do uh, in Europe. And as I said, that's why we need you guys to continue doing your great work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David, I see that you have a, a question. So uh, uh, please do. Thank, thank you, Shai. Uh, 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 Professor Navon, thank you again. It's uh, wonderful to hear you always. Uh, and I guess you, you partially answered my question. I mean, where do you see Israel today given uh, we are at an historical cross point. There's, there may or may not be a major change in the United States in terms of its foreign policy, uh, the rising threat of Iran, the convergence with the Arab states, uh, and at the other hand, you know, the crisis in Israel that is ongoing. Um, so where do you see Israel in light of the history that you described? Well, I must say that, um, first of all, when I think the, uh, one of the purposes of this book, of course, as I said, is to look at Jewish history with a wide historical perspective. So I think when you look at Israel's issues and challenges today uh, in a wider historical perspective, it helps a lot to have precisely a perspective. In that sense, I would put the normalization uh, with the uh, Gulf states and hopefully soon with Saudi Arabia uh, in the context of a wider historical perspective, which is, I spoke before about Ben-Gurion. Uh, Ben-Gurion initiated in the late 1950s a diplomatic initiative, which was called at the time, known as at the time, as the periphery strategy, uh, when Israel was completely isolated in, in a hostile Middle East, and Israel's only uh, military ally at the time uh, France was already showing sign of taking its distances from Israel and the United States at the time was not interested in becoming an ally of Israel. So Ben-Gurion built this whole strategy with the Mossad uh, of building special ties with Iran and Turkey against uh, the Soviet Union and against Arab nationalism led by Egyptian President Nasser. That strategy was actually quite successful but it only lasted until we had friendly regimes in Tehran and Ankara, which is obviously no longer the case today. Now, what's interesting is that today you have a reversal of that strategy. I think the strategy is still relevant. But instead of having an alliance today with Iran and Turkey against the Arab world, we have an alliance with the Arab world against Iran and Turkey. And this goes to show that uh, if you look at things in a wider perspective, you receive a completely different image. So generally speaking, I am very optimistic about Israel. I must say that since you ask a question about our political crisis, uh, on this specific issue, I think the political crisis we're going through is unprecedented in the history uh, of Israel, and that we are reaching a boiling point that needs really 
uh, to be taken care of. This uh, political crisis is really unprecedented, even though, again, uh, in terms of our foreign policy, which is, of course, the topic of my book and of my presentation tonight, uh, despite our political crisis and despite uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, state of the pandemic uh, in Israel, at the same time, Israel is still having uh, diplomatic achievements uh, with the uh, normalization with the UAE and now with, with Bahrain. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. 